my topic today is going to be SI joint, sacral nerve root, and caudal epidural injections. And one of the most important things that I try to teach is that it's important that we understand the sono anatomy first, know the normal anatomy, then the sono anatomy, and then go in and put the needles. There are, there are some controversial topics here, so we look at the evidence also behind the procedures that we do. First, looking at the sacroiliac joint, this is something which we, ha which we have all seen from Gray's anatomy. We are approaching the sacral, sacroiliac joint in the posterior inferior part of the joint, right here. And the sacroiliac joint, as you all know, is made up of both synovial tissue, the bottom, which is a synovial joint, and above that you have fibrous, which is almost two-thirds of the joint is all fibrous part. So typically, we inject at the synovial aspect so that we get some pain relief because it's much more, much less effective based on various reports um, if you approach much more higher cephalon. Now, it is covered by various ligaments. I won't bore you with the final details about the ligaments, but understand that, oops, understand that when we look at the sono anatomy, one of the key structures that we always look for is the bony anatomy. And so first we start using, placing the transducer in the midline when you see the medial sacral crust. And then we move laterally onto the posterior superior iliac spine and then scan down right over the foramina for S1 as well as S2. Typically we would like to inject it at the level of S2, the SI joint at the level of S2. Now, this is the typical way in which I have been taught and that's how we scan. Now, if you were to look at the median crust, this is how it's going to appear. It's almost like a, I'm going to start using this. It's going to be almost like a acoustic shadow beneath the medial crust. It's very prominent, high up. So if you want to st start scanning from the lumbar spine, that's also fine. You, you'll notice the difference in architecture as you move further down. Now, if you were to look at a longitudinal view, this is how it's going to ap appear. Um, um, a transverse view, the median crust, you have the sacrum, and you have the ilium there, portion of the ilium. As we move further, when you actually bring the sacroiliac joint to the center of the screen, this is not how it would normally appear in the patients that we typically inject, because it's, a lot of it is fused. So what you want to do is you want to identify the first S1 foramina, then the S2 foramina, the chances of success, as I told you, is much greater when you approach the S2. And then if, you, if, you were, if you're able to visualize that small gap, that's where you want to target. As you can see, this is a patient who, whose SI joint is somewhere around four centimeters, the typical Wisconsin patient. Now, moving on, if, you, if, if I can show it to you real time, I've started scanning. This is at the level of, you have the ilium. It's at the level of S1. My needle is actually going into S1. So if I move further, yes. And if I can identify the sacroiliac joint and reposition the needle into the sacroiliac joint, then it's likely to be effective. One of the important take home points or one of the things that I always stress upon is I always do a sacral arthrogram. So I, I do this procedure, place the needle, and then take a fluoro picture and then do the contrast study before I inject steroid. This is again a real time showing how the needle is being redirected and placed into the sacroiliac joint. You can see the needle going in. Mouse is having a mind of its own. Maybe the cat is away. There is, um, I'm just going to review some of the literature that's available out there in terms of the evidence. Now, one of the earliest studies was demonstrating that it was feasible to do sacroiliac joints with just ultrasound guidance. And this is one of the earliest studies. And subsequently, they were able to uh, show that there is definitely an increased success rate when, when you do multiple procedures. And approximately, it takes about 30 injections before you become savvy with that. This is from um, Austria, where two of my colleagues are. A feasibility study using second generation ultrasound contrast. What they did was they used Sonoview to inject into the joint 
um, to, um, they gave son of you intra, intra, intravenous, and then looked at the ultrasound picture to see how the contrast uptake is. And they were able to show that there is significant enhancement at the uh, active sacroiliac joints, meaning when the, when the patient has sacroiliitis, it actually lights up more than the normal patient. This is, again, showing how, how the shadowing is different between the normal versus the abnormal um, joints. So if you look at the number of patients and volunteers that they injected contrast with, you can easily differentiate between active and inactive joints. So that's one option. Other more interesting study that I found recently was from Bernard Morigal. And what they did was they actually fused CT images onto the ultrasound pictures. And they show that it is really, really beneficial to actually incorporate these two techniques in it. If I were to pull up some of the data that they have, they did both cadaver study as well as patient, patients. And out of the 10 patients, as you can see, every, uh, out of the cadavers, every one of them was intraarticular. This was uh, with the CT overlay. This was con confirmed with CT. Now, in patients, what they did was they looked at uh, CT images that were obtained prior and fused them. So out of the 10 patients, as you can see, the significant success rate, uh, they followed up with about three-month uh, pain relief, VA scores, and they found that there was significant reduction in pain. And this was the way they were able to validate the success of the sacroiliac joint injection. Another interesting study was ultrasound-guided sacroiliac joint injection in patients with established sacroiliacus. This was, again, verified with MRI. Should we actually be going ahead and doing um, MRI scans for everybody? Probably not. But one interesting outcome that they had was, despite ultrasound guidance, SI joint injections remain technically challenging, which you all know, even when you use fluoroscopic guidance, it is sometimes really challenging. So that's, that's one important point to remember. Moving on to sacral transforaminal injections. The good news is that I'm not going to be talking too much about evidence because there's nothing. Um, when, when I typically do the sacral transforaminal injections, once again, I do it in the fluoro room, place the needle, confirm it with digital subtraction and geography before injecting steroids. I think that's a safer way to do. Although the chances of major injury is less, I still don't want to take that risk. Again, we obtain a transverse view over the sacrum. The medial crust is identified. The transducer is moved lateral. And then you are able to see the caudal foramina. In, um, and I'm going to show you real time how I start doing. This is from the lumbar spine. I start moving down. As I move into the sacrum, there is a clear differentiation. And you can see that the ultrasound waves actually go through the foramina. That's the S1 transforamina. Now, like I told you before, it is also important to review the anatomy. If you can just think about the medial crest and then moving lateral and then identifying the sacral transferamina as a gap in the con continuity of the hyperechoic line. Again, the medial sacral crest. Oops. Now, when I, when I do a transferaminal injection, as you can see, this is a, this is a typical patient from Wisconsin. The resolution is likely to be poor because of a lot of uh, adipose tissue. And you have, you, you, I do it out of plane because it's a smaller trajectory. Typically, it's very difficult to see the 25 gauge needle that I put in. So I do an out of plane technique and drop the needle in. Once I am in, what I do is I, I confirm it with fluoro. And this again, this is the S1 um, foramina that you can see. Should play. Yes. So the needle is being introduced here into the foramina. As you can see, it's not very clear to visualize the needle tip. It is even less clear to visualize the sacral foramina. But it is definitely easier for you to place the needle and then check it at fluoro. Yes. So here it's a very clear tissue movement to suggest where you are, and that shows you the gap between the foramina, and my needle goes right through. This 
is again another picture where you can see the needle going through into the foramen. So there is no evidence for uh, sacral transforaminal injections. I'm not going to talk much about it. The last topic has got a lot of utility, which is that caudal epidural injections. Once again, those of us who are practicing pain, we have the habit of injecting steroids. So it is, again, important that once your needle is in, once you have placed the catheter, it is really, really critical to do a contrast study prior to injecting steroids. Sacral hiatus and corno are the first things that I identify. I use a transverse view. You can, I'll show you how the pictures look. They are two double humps. And um, then I rotate the transducer to 90 degrees to get a longitudinal view. At that point, you can see the sacral coccygeal ligament. And this is a typical appearance. It's almost like, um, almost like a bunny, you know, two years. And then you have a sacral coccygeal ligament in between. This is the posterior part of the sacrum. So real time, if I were to in place a needle, I would do it in plane, coming straight down through the sacral, sacral coccygeal membrane. And this, as you can see, is part of the sacrum. Again, that is your epidural space that you're targeting. You are able to see the needle to a certain extent. But beyond that, you won't be able to see. That is one of the limitations, because bone prevents you from visualizing the entire needle. Another way of identifying whether you are in a place where you should be is to do a Doppler study. In a Doppler study, if the predominant color flow is one, then it is more likely that you are in the epidural space. If there is a lot of aliasing, it's probably you are intravascular. But again, this is one way of identifying. The other sure way of identifying is to use a contrast and digital subtraction. Now, let's look at some of the evidence that's out there. One of the earlier studies, they had a very nice picture. And that's the main reason why I'm citing this article, because this is something which I have used in many of the previous slides. So going back to the anatomy, they find that it is possible and safe to do a caudal epidural steroid injection. Whether it's going to be useful or not was something that needs to be studied later on. So we go on to look at the anatomy of the sacral hiatus. You know that there, there is likely to be significant variations in the sacral hiatus. So do not go with a fixed picture saying that I'm going to see two years. Maybe the one year will be missing. Or it may be much higher up. So you have a possibility of being in the wrong place. This was um, reported a few years ago and very well received. A lot of people quoted this article and started using caudal epidural um, needle placement much more because of this particular study. And I think, I think they have a very valid point in demonstrating the technique of caudal epidural placement. What is missing is still that we do not know whether Anybody has done a head-to-head -head study to compare them? Nothing has yet been published. This was the study that I was referring to when I talk about the use of Doppler to identify between intravascular placement as opposed to an epidural placement. And they were able to show that in their patients, in their patient population, as you can see, this is not the typical Wisconsin patient where the sacral depth is hardly one to two centimeters. But still, they were able to clearly demonstrate that epidural steroid injections can be performed safely with just ultrasound and Doppler. 